Now, as you remember last time, I tried to suggest that when we think about the origins of the war, uh, it's it's worthwhile to separate the long-range developments that made the political system, the international system, difficult to operate, and the particular concatenation of events uh, that made war happen in the summer of 1914. Well, today's lecture is going to be very much about the first of these two. Today's lecture is going to be very much about the, the international system as a whole. And next Monday, when we come back together again, uh, I'll talk about the, the summer of 1914 and try to talk about how some of the things we, some of the larger issues we talked about, we'll talk about today, uh, f- focus in on the events of that summer and produced war when and where it happened. Now, one way to start thinking about this is to remember uh, that in the course that you've had this semester, the war that began in 1914 is in fact the third world war, not the first. Uh, the first world war was the one that began in 1758 and, and ended in 1763. It's the war that Europeans call the Seven Years' War. Americans tend to call it the French and Indian Wars. It's a war that began in Europe but had a global extension, was fought in the Americas, in in Europe, in the subcontinent of uh, South Asia, in both the Pacific and the Atlantic. The Second World War, of course, was the one that uh, began in 1792 and ended at the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. Once again, it was European in its origins, in many ways European in its consequences, Uh, But it was also fought in various parts of the world, in both great oceans, in in America as well as in Europe. And then, of course, the Third World, the one we call the First World War. And finally, looking ahead beyond our chronological frame, the War of 1939 to 1945, what we call the Second World War, and which we devoutly hope will be the last Now, if we think about these four conflicts, and we imagine them as a kind of set along an arc of modern history, a couple of things immediately become apparent. The first is, they become progressively violent, progressively total. The wars all Four wars are destructive, but they become progressively so. And by the time we get to the Second World War of the 20th century, the distinction between combatant and civilian is virtually extinguished. So they become increasingly violent and increasingly lethal. Here is the, uh, here is the handout. Thank you, Chris. Um, They become increasingly violent and increasingly lethal. The second thing about these four is that they become increasingly global. Now, it's true that all four of them are fought all over the globe, but there is, I think, a distinct difference between the revolutionary and Napoleonic wars that you studied a few weeks ago and the First World War that we're looking forward to this week and next that by 1914, the the global connections within which the war occurred are substantially stronger, substantially more extensive. The roots and branches that reach out from Europe to, to tie it to the rest of the world are thicker and stronger, more, more apparent. Until finally, by the Second World War of the 20th century, the, the global connection is, is, uh, is much more apparent. And by the end of that war, Europe as a central factor of world history has largely been extinguished. But what I want to talk about today are those ideas and institutions, those attitudes, those patterns of practice, 
that give the war, its our war, the War of 1914, uh, its global character. And I begin with the fact that in the last decades of the 19th century, for the first time in human history, uh, a singular, create, cohesive, interrelated global society is created. Now, it's certainly true that if we look back to the wars of the, the voyages of exploration in the 15th century, 16th century, there's the beginning of a, of a world history. But I think it's pretty apparent that it's really only in the 1870s and 1880s that you begin to go to a world that is, in fact, the world we still live in, a globalized world. There's a lot of talk about globalization these days, and, and of course, globalization has intensified. But in fact, the real breakthrough, as I'll try to argue, the real breakthrough in the globalized world that we live in today comes in the period that we want to talk about. That is the end of the, of the 19th century. There are three dimensions of this that we can talk about, three ways in which this global world took shape, three technologies that helped to create it. And the first of these is that quintessentially 19th century technology, the railroad. Now, I know anybody who's ridden on Amtrak has a lot of trouble thinking about the railroad as a kind of symbol of modernity. Uh, but in fact, it is a deeply, fundamentally modern invention. And it is, more than any other single technological breakthrough, the invention that, that made the 19th century what it does. Think for a minute about the simple fact that the railroad represents, again, for the first time in human history, a qualitative change in the nature of land travel. People walked, people had a wheeled conveyances, people went on horseback. Over time, the roads got better, carriages became more comfortable. But all of these changes down to the end of the 18th century, all of these changes are, are changes in degree. The railroad is a change in kind. It's a fundamental categorical transformation in the way people move across space. The railroad brings with it massive changes in technology, encourages changes, for example, in metallurgy, encourages the extraction of more fossil fuel from the ground, well, you can imagine, you could, you, it doesn't take you long to think about the way in which the, the, the creation of railroads changes the way uh, industries operate in a whole variety of ways. Well, it's not the subject of our talk today, but it's, it's something to, to think about as, you, as we contemplate the processes that I'm interested in. In the Early 19th century, the railroad is, uh, develops in this part of Western Europe and Britain. But in the course of the 19th century, it, it steadily spreads to various parts of the world. Uh, between the last decades of the 19th and the earliest decades of the 20th century, uh, the number of railroad, the number of tracks in the world roughly double in size. And there are, more important than that, a number of those great kind of transcontinental breakthroughs. This is 1869 in Utah, the driving of the Golden Spikes. Those of you who have been to, uh, I think, isn't the Golden Spikes in Sacramento these days? Or, in any case, uh, this is the this is the spike that is driven that that represents the spanning of the North American continent, May 1869. We've already talked about this one, the spanning of the trans of the uh, Eurasian continent, 
the creation of that railroad line that links uh, St. Petersburg up here uh, to Vladivostok on the Pacific. Again, a massive change in the way space was uh, related to one another. Changes that drew people together and made possible connections that hadn't been possible before. The second technology, like the railroad, a, a late 18th, early 19th century technology that spreads at the end of the century, uh, is the telegraph. And here the, the, the development is even more dramatic. There were 4,000 lines, 4,000 miles of track of, of not track, of, of wires in uh, 1880. They were 400,000 by 1910. So it's a, it's a jump in a, a hundredfold. That meant that by 1900, if you were in San Francisco and you wanted to contact somebody in London, you could do it in not much more time than it would take you today. A little more time. It would be a lot more expensive. But the fundamental breakthrough had already occurred. Now we can get on our cell phone and, and simply dial a number, and you're there instantaneously. But think of the difference between that telegram that you could send in 1900 and what you would have had to do in 1850, where you would have written a letter, given it to somebody on a ship, had that ship go around the South, uh, South America, cross the Atlantic, and get to London. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, once again, a difference in kind, a difference in kind that has a, a fundamental impact on people's lives. And finally, and in some ways most important, or certainly as important as the railroad, the development of steamships. Again, we have to see this in the, in the wide expanse of human history. For most of human history, people crossed water on vessels made out of wood or bark or paper, propelled either by their own strength or by the wind. Beginning in the second half of the 19th century, people sailed the waters in ships made out of metal, driven by engines that are propelled by steam, either with coal and later with iron, with um, oil. Once again, a qualitative change. Once again, a, a, a categorical change in the way people uh, moved across space. This meant that, that ships now were reliable in a way they had never been before, no longer dependent upon currents and winds. It meant you could have timetables for ships the way you would for stagecoaches and railroads, something that had never happened before. And the quantity and, and the, the quantity and the speed of uh, interaction over the waters increases equally dramatically. What does this mean? Well, it, it means two things. It means, first of all, that the level of connection among people is greatly increased. But it also means that the level of penetration, the way in which the outside world could move into areas that had previously been closed to it. How many of you have read Joseph Conrad's great novel, The Heart of Darkness? Right? Okay, it's a novel about a steamship ride. It's a steamship ride that Conrad himself took. It's a novel about a steamship up the Congo, that would have been impossible without steam. You couldn't do this with a sailboat. And this is, again, just one example among hundreds we can think of, of how this process that I'm talking about not only connected people, but allowed the outside world, the political world, the economic world, the world of culture, the world of soldiers, but also the world of missionaries, allowed that world to get into places that had previously been closed to them. Two things of particular importance for us. One is trade, commerce. Look at this line here. Right? This, this measures the overall level of world commerce from the 1820 
down to whatever this is. So look how this grow. It grows in the 19th century gradually. And then about 1870, the line of ascent becomes steeper so that, in fact, the level of world trade in the last decades of the 19th, first decade of the 20th century, doubles. Enormous change in, in, the, in the way in which economies are organized. Enormous change in, what, in the way people live their lives. The kinds of clothes they can buy. The kinds of jobs they have kinds of competition they face, and all the rest. So the second thing that happens, equally important, is that the amount of territory that falls under the hands of the colonizing powers greatly increases. This is also a part of this process of globalization, part of the creation of this global society. The amount of territory controlled by Europeans and their uh, their successors doubles between 1880 and 1910. Roughly 200,000 of the world's people who were not colonized in 1880 are colonized by the first decade of the 19th century. Roughly one-fourth of the Earth's surface changes hands as it moves under the control of colonizers in this period. This includes virtually all of Africa, very little of which was colonized in the middle of the 19th century. By the end of the century, virtually all of it, except for Liberia and Abyssinia, Virtually all of it, not virtually all of it, simply all of it, is uh, now been carved up. The same is true of Asia. China, although China retains a kind of quasi-independence, China has been deeply penetrated along its coast by various treaty ports and concessions, whereas much of the rest of Asia is either in the hands of the Japanese, a newcomer on the colonial scene, or the European powers. This means now that the world, both commercially and in terms of its colonial territorial possession, has been carved up. The connection between commerce and colonization, between these two byproducts of uh, globalization. The connection is a complicated one. The the word imperialism, which, by the way, takes on its modern meaning exactly where in the period that we're talking about, the word imperialism tends to to merge together the, the economic and the political side of this global conquest of the world by colonizers. In fact, it's 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 more complicated than that. Uh, In fact, there's a lot of economic exploitation, a lot of economic domination uh, that doesn't result in territorial changes. The British, for example, have a powerfully dominant role in much of Latin America, whereas they have very little territory there. In some ways, Latin America is economically more important than Britain than some of the new colonies where there is a uh, formally under British rule. So the the relationship between commerce and colonization, between the conquest of ter- the world territorially and its conquest economically. This is a, a complicated relationship and one that we ought not to, to simply merge in the, in the notion of imperialism. One of the, I think, most imprecise and, and ill-used words in the historian's vocabulary. One thing is clear. And this is, I think, the most important part of this whole story for our present purposes. One thing is clear. And that is that by the end of the 19th century, people, more and more people, particularly Europeans, Americans, begin to feel that the world is filling up. That the world is closing down that there are no longer those 
open spaces in which expansion was possible. That there are no longer those places where uh, new forces can move and expand. This is a fundamentally important assumption about the world that arises in one place after another in the period that we're talking about. It's an important assumption, I think, in the minds of the people who decide in the summer of 1914 that they're going to go to war. The sense that the world is, is, a, is a crowded a crowded place, which there's not a lot of room to maneuver, which you've got to move, you've got to take, you've got to act. You've got to take something, and if you don't, someone else will. There are three examples of this that I'll give you, although one could do this uh, endlessly. Those of you who have studied American history have undoubtedly heard of Frederick Jackson Turner. 1893, Turner writes a famous essay on the role of the frontier, in American history. And you can see from the quotation, uh, I break all habits by having some text on, uh, on the PowerPoint. Um, you can see here by the, the, the basis of Turner's argument. What the Mediterranean Sea was to the Greeks, breaking the band of custom, offering new experiences, calling out new institutions and activities, that and more, the ever-retreating frontier has been to the United States directly and to the nations of Europe more remotely. And now, four centuries from the discovery of America, at the end of a hundred years of life under the Constitution, the frontier has gone, and with its going has closed the first period of American history. 1893. Turner a man of middle aged in 1893, had experienced this himself. He'd been a young man when the last Indian Wars had been fought. He'd been a young man when the, when the last movement of, of people into the, into the new lands of the, of the prairies had occurred. Turner spent most of his career in Wisconsin, at that, at that point where, where the lands were, were now closed off, once a frontier country but in living memory, now no longer, no longer so. And you get in this comment, now in its American version, but there are many, many others, you get in this comment a sense that is of fundamental importance for this global world that I'm talking about. It's a smaller world. It's an interconnected world. But it's a world without those spaces, without those frontiers, without that possibility of expansion. And for Turner, this has a fundamental effect on America. But it has equivalence for many other people as well. Take, for example, this character here, (laughs) Cecil Rhodes. Now, some of you may, in fact, apply for a Rhodes Scholarship. Some of you may, in fact, take advantage of some of uh, Cecil Rhodes' uh, many, many fortunes. And here he is. Astride Africa. You just notice what he's holding in his hands? Telegraph line, right? Uh, striding across Africa, representing his great dream one of them, one of many, he was a dreamer, was Rhodes. His great dream was was to build a rail line from the Cape of Africa up to Cairo, to unite this this continent the way the United States had been united in 1869, the way Eurasia would be united by the Trans-Siberian. This is what Rhodes wants. This is what Rhodes wants to do. He's already made two massive fortunes, one in gold and one in diamonds. He's already taken possession of a huge tract of land. He was one of the world's few people to have a country named after him, Rhodesia. No longer going to call that anymore. And so we had, as one of the great, uh, what shall we say, one of the great beneficiaries of globalization, Rhodes had grabbed everything that he possibly could. He had become fabulously wealthy, enormously powerful. 
He had lived in this age of globalization and he had used it for himself to do what he wanted. 1902, Rhodes' end is near the end of his life. He knows it. He sits out on the veranda of his great house in Africa. He looks up at the stars above the sky, the evening sky. He sees the scars. And he says to the person sitting next to him, the world is parceled out. It's all been taken. Look at those stars up there. Look at those planets. How near and yet how far. I would take them if I could. Uh, and you get in this, in this urge for expansion, that fundamental kind of craziness that drove Rhodes to, to take everything that he could. But you also get in that sense of regret, that sense that the world is closing down, uh, that way in which Rhodes, like so many others, came to believe that the world was filling up there was no longer the room that there had been to grab, to take, to possess, to acquire that had been part of his own brilliant career. And finally, my last example. Uh, a geographer, the least known of the three, a man named Halford McKinder, but in many ways, I think, the most astute and the one most relevant for our purposes. Uh, McKinder was a geographer who was deeply, in, deeply impressed by the importance of the railroad and deeply impressed by the way in which the railroad changed what he saw as the geopolitics of Eurasia, what he called the world island. And, 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 and McKinder's career, is, his work, is in one way or another an exploration of how the penetration of the world island, penetration of Eurasia, set a series of geopolitical problems that particularly Britain, his country, had to come to terms with. Well, in 1904, McKinder writes a, a famous article called The Pivot of World History. And let me read to you what he says because I think it comes very close to being the, the fundamental underlying assumption that I'm, I'm trying to, to get to. From the present time forth, we shall have to deal with a closed political system. And nonetheless, it will be one of worldwide scope. Closed political system, worldwide scope. Every explosion of social forces, instead of being dissipated in a surrounding circuit of unknown space and barbaric chaos, will be sharply re-echoed from the far side of the globe and weak elements in the political and economic organism of the world will be shattered in consequence. Now look at the assumptions that are all that are built into this statement, right? It's a single world, a closed world, a world in which something that happens in a far off place will reverberate, will have resonance throughout. It's not a world like that naval battle that occurred off the coast of uh, Vancouver at the end of the 18th century between the British and the Spanish. Uh, the naval battle, but by the time anybody in Europe found out this battle had occurred, the whole political scene had changed and the battle became irrelevant. That's not going to happen anymore. People are going to know the crises, the conflicts, the explosions. And certainly this is the world we live in anything that happens anywhere, even before it appears on our TV screens or our phones. But even now, even in this period, in 1904, this is going to have a, a worldwide connection. But notice also the last lines in McKinder's comments. And the weak elements in the political and economic organisms of the world will be shattered in consequence. Because it's now, now not only 
that these frontiers are closed. It's not only that the world is connected. It's not only that spaces are now narrowed, more congested, but the conflict for these spaces, the conflict between the weak and the strong, the conflict between those who will survive those who will make their way in this new, more competitive, more closed, more congested, more conflictual world. This conflict will become more intense. And the weaker elements, the weaker states, those states that are unable to sustain themselves, they are inevitably going to go under. Frontiers are closed, the world is filled, and the conflict between the weak and the strong, always a part of human history, always a part of this fallen world we live in, the conflict between the weak and the strong now has global consequences. Consequences from which one cannot hide. There will be no longer places where you can go and hope to stay out, to opt out. They're not going to be there anymore because this world is now too closely connected, too closely entwined. For many uh, Europeans, or at least for some, Americans too, I suppose, the expansion of the world, the closing of the frontiers, the filling of space was represented as this rather crude cartoon would have it as the triumph of civilization, this young lady in white, over barbarism, these forces over here. Civilization, Christianity, capitalism, liberalism, all of those forces of the civilized world uh, which were connected with Europe and were intrinsically a part of the European experience. The triumph of the world, its expansion, the steamship, the railroad, the telegraph, all of this was part of that march of progress. We know, <coughs> we know of course, it didn't really work that way. Looking back, from our perspective, we're not apt to see it as a, confl- as a triumph of civilization over barbarism. In fact, we might want to think about defining civilization and barbarism in somewhat different ways. Uh, this picture comes from the Belgium Congo. Not, I think, a necessarily typical, but not also a unique example of European imperialism at work. Uh, These men are holding hands that have been cut off of uh, natives because they refused to work hard enough in King Leopold of Belgium's rubber plantations. So you can see that uh, the triumph of globalization and rubber, after all, is is a wonderful example of a product that is connected. It's connected to transportation. It's connected to trade. It's connected to all of the things we're talking about. You can see how this process of globalization had for a number of people extremely brutal, cruel facade. There was, in this process of uh, frontier closing, There was in this process of expansion always an an element of violence, always an element of violence that increased in its incidence as the century went on. And I I give you here as another text, those of you who are, some of you might be interested in in, uh, counterinsurgency and in uh, this kind of warfare that we still find ourselves involved in. This is a book published in 1896 by a British colonel, uh, still in print, and still in many ways one of the the very best books uh, to be uh, 
to be read about, about, about this subject. And Caldwell was a soldier in this process of expansion. He fought in Afghanistan in the end of the 19th century and uh, knew what he, was, what he was talking about. Small wars occurred everywhere and as the frontiers expanded. Small wars occurred, for example, in, the, in the North America, where between 1898 and 1902, the United States sent Marines into various parts of Central America 20 times in order to put down um, insurrections which were thought of as being uh, hostile to American interests. Uh, between 1890 and 1910, French, British, and Dutch forces were involved in more than 100 occasions of conflict. Some of them small, but some of them not very small at all. The French, for example, had about 40,000 troops in, Indonesia, in Indochina for over a period of 20 years in the late 19th and early 20th century. The Dutch, we don't really think of as being a particularly uh, uh, aggressive and militaristic people, but the Dutch fought a long and bitter series of wars in Indonesia in the, ninth, in the late 19th century, some of them uh, coming, kind of coming to the threshold of genocide. Uh, small wars. The British Army, if we think about Britain you know, from the, uh, in a way as being a civilized, calm, peaceful place, bowling on the lawns and all that. Uh, the British Army was involved in combat every year but one during uh, Queen Victoria's reign. And once again, many of these were small, but some of them were not small. Some of them were uh, very, very violent and vigorous. Uh, small wars suggest wars of insurrection, wars settled by expeditionary forces, but it's important to remember that for those on the receiving side, these weren't small wars at all. Here, for example, is an artist's version, artist version of the Battle of Omdurman, um, uh, 1898, South Sudan, Sudan, South Sudan, still a violent place in 2014. This was a Example of Islamic radicalism in its 19th century version. Uh, an army composed of uh, people who were resisting the expansion of Egyptian and British influence south along the Nile River, who rebelled in an effort to create a kind of Islamic republic that would be free of what they took to be uh, dangerous influences, secular, irreligious, blasphemous influences. And then, as a result of this, they, was a, they, they killed the British forces in the town of Khartoum, and the British sent an expeditionary force to destroy these radical Islamists uh, and to restore order. And that's what's going on right here in this battle. To give you an idea of what small wars could mean for the losers, the British, who had gunboats on the Nile, who had machine guns, repeating rifles, highly disciplined army, the British lost 45 dead and about 400 wounded. Their enemies, the Islamists, lost 4,700 dead and somewhere between 10 and 16,000 wounded. Small wars for the British, not too small for the other side. And that, again, is a very much a, a part of this larger story and very much a part of the, of the violence, the violence that attended the expansion of global society, the creation of that global world, which in many, as I said, in many important ways, 
is not only is the context within which to understand the outbreak of the First World War, but it's also, as we immediately recognize, the world we still live in. And in some of the same places, some of the same stories go on in different versions. This is a group of German soldiers, 1907, going out uh, to uh, put down a rebellion in German Southwest Africa and essentially to put it down by destroying the, the indigenous society that attempted to protect and fight against uh, the incursion of a settler uh, society that wanted to fence off the land, turn them into kinds of laborers and, and the rest. Um, this uh, gentleman here inspecting the troops will make an appearance later on in our lecture. This is uh, Count von Schlieffen of Schlieffen plan fame. In addition to these insurrectionary wars, in addition to this, this war of, uh, against the, the native peoples who, who are trying to resist the expansion of European economic, cultural, and political power, there are in the late 19th and early 20th century a series of other colonial wars in which people fight over other people's property, other people's territory. Spanish-American War is a perfect example of this. Russo-Japanese War, the Italian-Ottoman War that we talked about briefly last week. These are wars in which colonial property, colonial territory is at risk. These are not wars of national survival. These are not wars in which the life of the state is at stake. In the Spanish-American War, American troops were not going to march down the streets of Madrid. And certainly Spanish troops were not going to march down the streets of Washington, D.C. It was a fight, it was a war going on for somebody else's property, for somebody else's territory. And that gave it its particular character. And it also and this is an important way of thinking about it for our story, it also insulated these wars from the European system. Because the small wars that Colonel Caldwell talks about, as well as the colonial wars between the United States and Spain, between Italy and the Ottomans, even between the Russians and the Japanese, and certainly between the Japanese and the Chinese, these are wars that did not engage the existence of the great European powers. Indeed, as willing as the European powers were to use violence in lots of different parts of the world, as willing as they were to do that, they were highly reluctant to use it against one another. So that the violence, the violence of counterinsurgency war, even the violence of colonial wars, is not clearly and immediately related to the violence among the great European powers. And that raises the problem of, of what, is, what is the connection? How do we get from the kinds of... Uh, wars that we're talking about now and the war that begins in 1914. How do we get there? What's the connection? Well, we began to see one of the connections last time when we talked about the naval race between Britain and America. We talked about the way in which uh, British... Um, and German naval forces in which British and uh, German naval forces uh, began to compete with one another 
And again, you have to see that in the light of the process that we're talking about today. The way in which control over the seas, control over the waves, became a part of this thinking about global society. And and to think about this, uh, I'll draw your attention to another one of these uh, bestsellers from the period that we're talking about. This is the bestseller by the American uh, naval officer Alfred Thayer Mahan uh, with the title The Influence of Sea Power on History. One of the the classic strategic books and it comes in 1890 precisely in the period uh, that we're talking about now. Mahan was a serving naval officer and in 1890 he got a job teaching history um, at the newly formed Naval College in uh, the northeastern United States. So he went into the library and he read a bunch of books and he thought that he saw something about world history that nobody had seen before. And that was the fundamental importance of controlling the oceans. Again, you can see how this reflects, you can see how this reflects that process of globalization that I've been talking about so far. Mahan argues that the key to national power is controlling the seas. This is what England made England the most powerful country in the world. This is what made it possible for the English to defeat Napoleon, for example. This is what made it possible for England to have the sort of dominant role. And if you wanted to challenge Britain, if you wanted to get into this game, you could only do it by doing what they did, which was to build a navy powerful enough to challenge British naval hegemony. You can see how this fits into the sense of a world closing down, a sense of competition, a sense of, of, uh, of congestion and conflict. Well, I mean, the British loved Mahan, right? It, it, it was a celebration of their power. Uh, Oxford and Cambridge gave him honorary degrees within a few days of one another. Uh, they thought he was, he was terrific. More interesting were those would-be powers who looked upon England as a model for something they'd like to be. The United States, Theodore Roosevelt. Mahan was one of his heroes. Alfred von Tirpitz, who we talked about last week, the Grand Admiral of the German Navy, had Mahan translated into German, made sure that every serious German naval officer had read his Mahan and knew this argument. The Japanese bought hundreds of copies, spread it around the Naval Academy in Japan as well. So this was, a, this was an argument that was very much a part of this sense that there's a big world out there, and a big world that if you're going to survive in it, if you're going to be one of the strong, if you're going to be one of the powers that's going to prevail, you've got to have the strength to do it. And not surprisingly, everybody who wants to get into this game begins to build a battle fleet, if possible a big battle fleet with battleships, with dreadnoughts, uh, that can assert their place in the world. Uh, but for most of the Europeans... For most Europeans, and this takes us now away from the international society as a whole, it takes us away from the global world. It takes us now into the world of the European great powers. We've begun, as you can see, to narrow our focus, to narrow our attention down now away from this larger systemic problem to the more specific one which will point us towards where we're going to end up in July 1914. The British regard the Navy as critical to their national survival. Everybody else wants to have a Navy. Everybody else realizes that Mahan has got some things to say. And particularly, of course, if your career depends upon having more ships, it's an argument that you're going to make very vigorously. But basically, with the exception of Britain, the countries on this map, 
realize that as important as navies are, as valuable as it is to have battleships, their survival will depend on their armies. Their survival will depend on their ability to marshal the resources, to have the plans, to master the technology that will allow them to defend their territorial existence against potential enemies. Small wars fought by professionals, fought by groups like the French Foreign Legion, fought far away. Small wars, violent, easy, quick, at least for some. Big wars. The big war that everybody worried about. The big war that politicians stayed up nights thinking about how to avoid. The war that the big wars that the general staffs of every country spent their time gaming and thinking and plotting and wondering and worrying about. These are wars fought by land armies. And this now takes us to the subject that I want to spend the next 10 or 15 minutes about. Let's think a minute about the dimensions of war. Time and space. From the very beginning. Simple. One stage, which people were throwing rocks at one another, maybe, fighting over a cave. Increasingly complicated as time goes on. But always time and space and the relationship between them. You've seen this in your class so far, right? People who were really good at fighting wars were good at figuring out how to master these dimensions of time and space. This is what Napoleon could do. He could move across space more quickly, more efficiently, more effectively. This is what the Prussian armies of 1866 and 1870 could do. Move, deploy, concentrate, win. Time and space and the relationship between them. Well, everything I've talked about up until now, particularly those transportation revolutions at the beginning that I talked about at the beginning, transform time and space. The steamship, the metal ship, the, all of those things that we talked about transform sea power. But more relevant for our immediate concerns, think of what the railroad does for land warfare. Think of what it does to the traditions, the traditional relationship, the conventional relationship of time and space. And once again, be aware how how the railroad represents a categorical shift for millennia men march to war on foot or rode on horseback beginning in the second half of the 19th century this is no longer true or no longer entirely true now you can move people across vast spaces by machines, have them arrive at their destination without the kinds of exhaustion and time that that the long march and the difficult ride would involve. So that the railroad, telegraph as well, but even much more dramatically, the railroad transforms those dimensions of war, dimensions of time and space on which warfare had had been once based. At the same time, since we're talking about war, and war has to do with killing, at the same time, the technologies of lethal death, of, of lethal action are equally transformed. They're transformed, for example, by this object here, which you will immediately recognize as a breech loading, uh, as a rifle bolt action. It's got a magazine. It holds five cartridges. Um, It is a dramatic change in the nature of infantry weapons. It's a dramatic change not only because it is much more accurate than the musket that had once been used, 
But it's a dramatic change because of the rapidity of fire. It's a dramatic change because you can reload it lying down. A muzzle-loading rifle, you must be standing, which means that you must present a target to the enemy that does not uh, that this does not require. It's revolutionary because the powder that it fires is smokeless, which means you can fire without revealing your position. In other words, this is a much more rapid uh, and a weapon that involves a whole series of changes in infantry tactics. No less dramatic in some ways is the machine gun, here shown as its use as it was primarily used in its early stages uh, in colonial wars, in those small wars. European officers were a little reluctant to think about machine guns against European troops. They didn't seem quite right to them. Uh, so they were very more, much more apt to be used, as we can see here, by the, in, the, in the colonies. It's only really towards the end of the 19th, early 20th century that the machine gun begins to be absorbed into infantry tactics of those armies as they prepare for big European wars. And once again, this greatly increases the rate of fire, greatly increases the lethal quality of the battlefield. And finally, and, and most important of all, uh, the invention in 1896 by the French uh, of an of a artillery piece that absorbs the recoil when it fires. This is the famous French 75. It's an artillery piece that allows you to keep firing from the same position. In other words, earlier... You have to rec- you'll have to absorb the recoil with the artillery piece by having the entire piece move. By setting up the barrel on a, on, a, on, a, on a set of tracks here, you can absorb the recoil, leave the piece as it stands, leave it sighted, and this greatly increases the rapidity of fire, greatly increases the accuracy, it greatly increases the uh, military effectiveness of artillery in all of its its forms. And you may have mentioned when we talk about the First World War in two weeks, you may have mentioned the fact that it is really in the First World War, it's the artillery that does the killing. Over two-thirds of the casualties in the First World War are caused by artillery of one sort or another. Now, All of this means that uh, by 1900, by the period that we're talking about, the railroad changes the dimensions of war. The the repeating rifle, the machine gun, the repeating artillery begins to change the the technology of uh, infantry tactics. All of this begins to put a great burden on the armies of Europe. All of them begin now to try to absorb this. It's very expensive. And the other thing they try to do and have to do is they have to get bigger. Because one of the dimensions that change, and this is also connected to the dimensions of time and space, is scale. So, so look at these figures, right? Between 1912 and 1914, the German army increases from 545,000 to 890,000. The French from 519,000 to 827. The Austrians from 295 to 478. Now, the, the, the Russians don't grow that much, although they grow by 400,000, which isn't shabby. Uh, but the, the, the manpower has never been the, the, Russian, the Russian problem. Um, <laughs> So what we have here is an extraordinary expansion in the number of, of, of men at arms. Remember, with the exception of Britain, these are conscripts. These are people who get drafted. 
all of these armies, although they have a professional cadre, a professional core of people who do the training and, and, and uh, are there on a full-time basis, all of these people are citizen sh- soldiers taken in for two, sometimes three, sometimes four years. Which means, of course, that they have a kind of political place that means by expanding them. It's a political problem, as well as a military, organizational, and economic one. That means that this growth in the arms race, this search for security, the search for being sure that you're strong enough to live in this congested, closed-off, increasingly competitive world, requires now that you demand from your population not only the resources necessary to pay for these new weapons, but also demands more time from the life of their young men. The only way the French make this jump is by increasing the level of service from two years to three. A big debate, as you can imagine. A big debate, not only for those people who are going to spend another 12 months in the army, but a big debate because the French suspect that if you have people in the army for that long, they're going to get infected by these conservative ideas that the professional army corps in France is famous for having. So the three-year service, essential, essential for the French feel, essential because their population is smaller than their enemy over here, essential is nonetheless a politically difficult case to make. The Germans, who also grow, and of course they grow in part because the French are growing, the Germans also have to make a case. They have to make a case because it costs more money. They also have to make a case because in order to get this number of soldiers, you're going to have to take money away from the Navy, which some people don't want to do. Well, The point of it all is that the debates about growing, about the army growing, the debates about having this expand are debates that are both military and political, and they all turn on a belief that you have to do it in order to survive. Every country has a plan how to use these huge number of troops. We'll talk a little bit more about these plans in a couple of weeks, but let me just mention the two most famous ones, of course, are the Schlieffen Plan, the plan that uh, was devised by oops, this formidable character here, Count von Schlieffen, uh, becomes chief of the German general staff in 1891, serves till 1906, um, and works out a plan in which Germany will solve the problem of having enemies on both the right and the left by putting all of its forces in the west, attacking France, knocking the French out, and then coming back across. We'll we'll talk more about that later on, but just to give you an idea about how these plans are operating and where they come out of this highly competitive, highly risk-laden atmosphere that I'm talking about. This is General Joffre. He will reappear in our lives in the early stages of the First World War. He becomes uh, chief of the French general staff in 1912, works out then what becomes this Plan 17, which is a, an offensive plan into the West. And again, as I said, more about that later. But now in the very few minutes that remain, let me just say a few... Uh, let me talk about two other books, uh, bestsellers in their day, and books that relate, I think, very much both to the the larger global context that I'm talking about, but also books that point us towards the question we'll pose when we meet again next Monday. The first of these is by a quite remarkable figure named Ivan Bloch. Uh, a Polish Jew, born in very modest circumstances in Warsaw, started life as a kind of itinerant peddler, 
uh, and through sheer intelligence and energy and drive, by the time he was in his late 20s, had made a fortune and had established himself as one of the leading advisors to the Tsar of Russia on, guess what? Railroads. So Bloch's, uh, Bloch's career, his fortune, his political influence comes from the fact that he is one of these people, in a way like Cecil Rhodes, a way like many of the others, like Tirpitz, like Mahan, one of these people who, who recognizes the forces that are at work around him and uses them for his own benefit. What Steve Jobs was to computers, Block was to railroads. Someone who recognized the direction of the future and could take advantage of it. Well, a Block is interesting to us, not because of his railroad work, but because he, in his later life, became an amateur military an amateur strategist. Locke was, a, was an, obviously a guy with lots and lots of energy. He'd made all the money he could imagine. So he decided he would read about warfare. And he sees, he thinks, something that everybody had missed, which was that war had now fundamentally changed its character, Changed its character because of those weapons I showed you pictures of, although Bloch didn't, uh, didn't really grasp the full significance of artillery. He did grasp the significance of the repeating rifle and the machine gun. Bloch said that battle, this, these new kinds of weapons, have changed battle fundamentally. And not only have they changed battle fundamentally, a lot of people had argued that, but they had made it impossible to win. These, these weapons were just too lethal. You, could never, you couldn't do any more what Napoleon had done. You couldn't even do any more what the Prussians had done in 1866 and 1870. That the nature of weapons now, the, the, this engagement of technology with warfare, had meant that the war of the future would be by its very nature indecisive. That it would drag on. It would be by its very nature a stalemate. It's no wonder that H.G. Wells, the British writer who read Bloch and, and learned a lot from him, when he looked at what was happening in the First World War, and he looked at the trenches on the Western Front, he said, this is Bloch's war. So Bloch recognizes that the future of war is not going to be a future of battles. It's not going to be a future of dramatic decisions. It's going to be a future of long, prolonged, socially and economically destructive mass killing. The second book about the future of war is by uh, the man whose picture we're looking at now, a man named Norman Angel. Um, British, spent a kind of early part of his life as a journalist, and then, like Bloch, although he never made the kind of money that Bloch did, like Bloch became interested in the nature of war and how war had changed. Angel wrote a book published in 1910, gone through many editions thereafter, called The Great Illusion, one of the, one of the first half of the 20th century's great bestsellers. The great illusion was not, as one sometimes hears, that there would be no more wars. The great illusion was that wars paid. And what Angel describes in great detail is the fact that the nature of modern war meant that wars would always be a losing proposition. You want some territory in France? Buy it. Don't conquer it. Because conquering it is inevitably going to cost you more than any territorial or political advantage is going to be worth. 
The illusion then is not that there won't be war. The illusion is that wars are an advantageous thing. Both Bloch and Angel recognize that war will still be possible. Both of them, in one way or another, are willing to accept the fact that sometimes violence will have to be used. Neither of them are are pacifists in the strict uh, moral or, or, or Christian sense. Both of them, though, and this is the point of the argument, both of them see that all of the things we've talked about today, the interconnection of the economy, the application of technology to warfare, the nature of the world of as a closed, congested system, that all of these things have changed the nature of war and have removed war as a sensible instrument of national policy. Small wars, maybe. Yeah, I mean, certainly Angel and Block were willing to consider the fact that you might there might be some natives down there that have to be taught where they where they belong. But big wars, the kind of wars that Napoleon fought, the kind of wars that Bismarck fought. These wars are things of the past. They have no place. They are, in the deepest, fullest sense, anachronistic. Well, they're right. How can we look back on the First World War and come to any other conclusion but the fact that it was a massive waste? A massive waste that destroyed societies, not to mention 10 million people. That nobody, nobody got out of the war anywhere near something worth the price they paid. And one of the reasons why the the First World War continues to, to fascinate us and why it continues to have the kind of place in many people's um, sensibility is because we see here the ironic contrast between price and accomplishment, between cost and benefit. So then we have to ask, as we read Block and we read Angel and we think about what they have to say and we think about how sensible it is, why didn't people realize that? Why didn't people see? Why didn't people see that the world that had been created by all of the things we've talked about today was a world in which great power war was no longer a sensible instrument of national policy. As part of an answer to that, let me read you one last quote. This is from the chief of the German general staff, Helmut von Moltke, December 1911. Everyone is preparing for the great war which they all expect sooner or later. It always remains the duty of every state not only to look the future calmly in the eye, but also to prepare itself for the day of decision that will judge whether its inner strength gives it the right to further claims on life or not. Everyone is preparing for the great war which they all expect will come sooner or later. And it's that underlying assumption about the nature of the world that essentially neither Bloch nor Angel, for all of the plausibility and logical power of their argument, it's that unspoken assumption about the world that their arguments cannot shake. People like Moltke, and not only soldiers like Moltke, but I think millions of other quite ordinary men and women, still believe that war, regrettable, to be avoided if possible, dangerous, that war is nonetheless an inevitable part of the life 
of states. Something that we have to prepare for, something we might have to be ready to fight, and something that when it comes, we'll test whether we as a right to a state, we as a state have the right to exist or not. And as we'll see, when we talk in detail about what happens in the summer of 1914, it's that assumption, often unspoken, but always there. It's that assumption that leads people to take the decisions they do that produces the war of 1914.